So Sean, thanks so much. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, I was thinking, I'm curious how you prepare for uh, being a presenter like this. How do you prepare mentally and spiritually? Ah, it's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with my own personal practice and the, the main practice that has been a go-to, you know, for me for many years is singing. I have a morning singing practice mm. and uh, as close to the first thing that I do when I wake up to capture the resonance, like that bass quality, you know, in the voice. Uh, there's a practice that I learned um, from a wonderful um, Indian musician named Nayan Ghosh many years ago. And he taught me this practice to sing long tones uh, as low as you can, you know, for um, like half an hour or so in the morning. And um, it really like it's an attunement practice, mm -hmm. you know, for me, uh, it's a vocal yoga practice that uh, in the opportunity to tune my voice, I am um, really feel like I'm tuning myself to the universe, you know, mm -hmm. and, and charging my voice uh, for whatever I do that day, whether it's speaking or singing. And I believe, you know, through my own experience and through teaching, you know, for many years now, that uh, the vocal yoga practices, uh, mantra, you know, and, and kirtan and, and singing practices, they really, um, they have this ability to make us into more articulate, like fluent mm -hmm. human beings, to be more aware of the impact of sound uh, mm -hmm. and how we weave our life, like through speech. And uh, so that that morning vocal practice is really like an underpinning, you know, for me, uh, very, very important. As far as the preparation for presenting a program, you know, so great. This, this we got to be in here this morning, like doing things early. Yeah, you I should know. say. So this is Friday, <laughs> and you're about to embark on a week weekend workshop program. So yeah. exactly, yeah. So it's so nice to be able to not rush, you know, and put and, and you know set up in a rush. So we we we've, we're set up already. Uh, it gives me some time and some space to refine, you know, my plan for the weekend. I get to tune into the space, and you know, sometimes I get to meet some of the participants on the earlier side, and and I listen to the group and, and I'm very uh, intuitive, you know, in my um, practice and, uh, and teaching, you know, as well. And so I come in with a plan, but also like to listen to the room, you know, mm -hmm. and tune into what people are sharing and, and feel the space. And oftentimes the plan will change based on, based on what I feel. <laughs> See, I, I think that is a really fascinating subject uh, in the area of balance kind of between like the planning and the intuition that all of us experience in, in our lives, right? It's like, okay, it seems wise to make a plan for something feels helpful, but at the same time to not be so rigid and be able to be malleable and, and to stay in, in the present moment. So has that kind of been a journey for you to honor those two aspects? Absolutely. I mean, the way that I like to think about it is templates, you know, I feel like a template is different from uh, like a set of instructions or like a boilerplate, you know, type of thing. And the template allows for there to be some freedom, you know, and some improvisation. And so it's taken me some time to, through the experience of teaching and playing music, like developing templates that I feel, mm. you know, are really strong, you know, and sturdy and consistently work, you know, over and over again. And then inside of those templates, I can improv and, and yeah. explore and be creative. The you know one ver version of that would be even like a song or a chant. Like we have a structure, but there's room inside of that that I uh, navigate like through oftentimes through vocal cues that we've developed as a kind of langu inner language with the band that um, can allow for us either to stretch out you know a section of the, of the song or or um, condense it or uh, repeat it, you know, there's different directions that we can go in. And uh, similarly, like with storytelling, which is a big part of the mm -hmm. teaching that I do, and even in teaching asana as well, there's a template, there's things that are, it's like a ritual, you know, there's the things that I do every time that I teach, you know, that create this beautiful structure in a way like a ceremony in a sense, but then it breathes, you know, there's room inside of there to, to 
feed off of, you know, what might bubble up, you know, in the space spontaneously. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Even when we were talking about, you know, our children before, I, th- I think about that with, with this of like how to create a container and then within that container, then the play can kind of happen. But the container itself kind of helps the play too, right? Absolutely. So my son Finn uh, is going to be five in a couple of weeks. And um, being a parent for the first time, one thing that I noticed uh, watching him in in the space from a baby all the way to now is part of the container, like you were speaking to, is just like the attention, Mm. you know, that I'm offering him and holding space for him, whether I'm playing with him directly. But I even noticed there's an influence in just being present like to what he's doing in a, in a room or in the front of the house. And when I'm paying attention, uh, there's this like energetic field, you know, this container that, that gets created, you know, Mm -hmm. that, that, uh, I feel like there's a care, you know, in that, that on an energetic level, like he feels, you know, even if we're distant and I'm doing my own thing in one part of the room and he's doing something else. And, uh, I feel like there's some, uh, parallel, you know, with teaching, mm. you know, in a sense as well, is that I feel like a big part of my role as a yoga teacher is uh, to hold the space, you know, to hold the container. I don't, I'm not the kind of a um, teacher, I don't believe I have the answer, mm. the single answer, you know, or my life experience has um, allowed for me to bring some knowledge, like to the people that, you know, come to practice with me. Maybe there's a little bit of that in there, but I feel like the, my uh, focus, my gift in teaching is to create space for people to connect to that inner truth, to their intuition, to that um, spirit of guidance that has been, I've had such a strong relationship, you know, and, and rather than have somebody come in with a hammer, you know, and, and sort of dogmatically tell me what I should believe or, you know, what the truth is or what I should, what should practice, I'm very, you know, feminine, <laughs> gentle in a sense. Like I wanna, I wanna create a container, like for people to discover that for themselves. And the container I feel is is so important. You know, uh, if it's too loose, then it's just any. You know, I don't, there's not enough structure there to hold up and people having an experience. So the container becomes a little bit like what I was speaking about earlier. The the template nor the ritual, nor the ceremony, or these practices that I facilitate that uh, allow for people to have their own experience. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I I totally resonate with this. And I'm like thinking about all the different ways that it comes up, like in teaching, but also in just in relationships that we have. And what I hear you saying, and what I consider is that often, you know, I think I do too much, right? push too hard. And, and so the practice is to, like you said, to create the space, just be the presence, right? And, and does this have to do also with like acceptance of just not trying to make things the way that I want to make them or make someone else the way that I mean, like I have something to, you know, teach you, not trying to do any of that, just having faith in the, the power of simply holding space and allowing other people to figure things out in their own time. Totally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Faith, trust. <laughs> yeah. yeah but what's, what's that part of ourselves that like almost like wants to go like too far, at least that I notice within myself, like, yeah. you know, and I definitely used to do that more in, in, in the past. And so I'm like, in a way, I feel like it's my relationship with silence too, Mm -hmm. of just seeing how powerful that can be. And I don't need to take that extra step. I can just allow it. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And for me, there's been a kind of seasoning, I feel like, over the years of practice and teaching that has created more of a sense of trust, you know, in myself and the universe, you know, and and others, students, you know, and I think part of my process maturing, you know, as a teacher over the years has been to trust what I have to offer, you know, Mm. and, and, uh, to trust that 
I don't have to over control, you know, things and that that spirit will speak, you know, to people in, in, the, in its own form <laughs> and in, in its own time. Mm. Uh, and I have such like respect for people's individual experience, you know, and also the um, that which is universal, like that pierces the boundaries of culture and lineages and tradition and language. You know, I just think there's some like I think of the, myself as a humanist or universalist. You know, like and and when when I allow myself the trust and the faith to really steep in that way of being in the world and holding space for people it, it definitely created more a sense of confidence you know than I than I had you know as a, as a teacher in earlier years uh, and uh, that there's a um, there's a Christian mystic uh, Meister Eckhart who said God is like a great underground river and there are many ways to get to that underground you know, reservoir it reminds me a little bit of um, uh, was it one truth, many paths? <laughs> yeah, truth is one, paths are many. Yeah, there, yeah, and, and so uh, there's a great. I feel there's a great freedom and trust, like in that way of looking at the world and looking at spirituality. Uh, well, when we're so, when, you know, the opposite would be just to be so tight mm. and uh, confined, you know, and and thinking. There's only one way to do it, you know, one one path to do it. There's not, a, I feel like there's not a lot of trust, you know, in that in that orientation. Mm. So that that worldview, you know, that kind of paradigm has been essential, like to that sense of trusting what happens, you know, more and more. Yeah. Do you yourself ever struggle with doubt, like this relationship between doubt and trust happening within you? Well, uh, I think that, you know, particularly that that has arisen when it comes to uh, death, mm. you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, one of the experience, you know, interesting death and then heart heartbreak, mm. <laughs> you know, that both yeah. of those I feel like are potentially like huge obstacles, mm. but also doorways, you know, and initiations uh, on the spiritual path. And, um, you know, I, I've, part of my the reason why I do what I do, like the reason why I'm a yoga teacher, the reason why I'm a musician, you know, and make creating mantra music just in this realm is because of heartbreak, <laughs> mm. you know, but initially, like I didn't, I, I, uh, I experienced just such a sense of grief, you know, and, and um, I felt myself tempted to become cynical mm. uh, and uh, and I but but I kept saying no I'm not gonna give up on love <laughs> mm. I'm not gonna give up on a you know living a fulfilling life I don't want to become someone that walks through the world you know grouchy you know and cynical and you know sort of small-hearted you know because I've the suffering that I've experienced and then similarly with with you know with death and death of loved ones you know there's definitely been a journey to um, and my brother Jeremy passed away uh, nine years ago now and uh, in a drowning you know accident which is really uh, shocking you know and really really sudden and and there was definitely was this period where through the grief you know and the horror you know of that. You just wonder, like, why, why would um, why would God let this happen? You know, or why you know yeah. is if this is it, it really? Um, it was it was it was a mystery, you know, to to experience that and to really ask, like, why? Like, why would something like this happen? And it was like every day. There's numerous things that happen to people, to animals, to the environment, you know, and that certainly so can sow seeds, you know, of doubt. And I would say like a big part of my personal process in grieving has been to connect to my brother's spirit, you know, in new, in new ways. Uh, and that's been a great act of trust, you know, in faith as well. And I've, um, I have, feel like I've made, I've made a connection, you know, and it's been, uh, 
incredible, like to to relate to him in a way that I wouldn't have thought, you know, was possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those are a couple of examples, you know, of places where I feel like doubt, you know, has has risen. I also just um, I leave room. I'm not the I'm not a I don't. Th- let's see, how do I say this? I think that there's a lot of room in the spirituality for doubt, <laughs> mm. you know, for darkness, for shadow, uh, for anger. I don't think being spiritual means being joyful and happy, you know, and and love and light and unicorns and bubbles and sparkles, yeah. you know. Like I don't, uh, I think that, um, I believe that living a spiritual life is one where we can, can embrace, you know, and include the shadow, the more shadowy experiences, you know, of being human, uh, which includes, you know, anger and grief and sadness and doubt and fear. Uh, I don't think you have to choose love or fear. Like I, I, I don't really believe in that dualistic way of mm-hmm. living. I think you can honor and include both, you know, and that that's a more holistic way to be. Do you feel like you've personally benefited from kind of uh, having this relationship with your own shadow and your own darkness? Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like I, I benefited from it. And then I have a tool, which is singing, that really allows for me to energetically integrate and express, you know, a lot of what is churning, you know, inside of me. Uh, it, I don't, uh, you know, certainly have, I've gone through therapeutic experiences in the past where I've talked about things and there's been some value in that. But for me, the practice of singing is like, uh, I think of it as like exercising the heart, our emotions, and also exorcising, like purging and releasing, yeah. you know? And then in that exercising, there's like an, inter- there's an integration and a deepening and a um, seasoning, you know, that happens. And what's so cool about it is it doesn't have, I don't have to talk about it. <laughs> I don't have to like analyze mm. it too much. It's happening through the act of singing, you know, and, and the emotion, this emotional spectrum and dynamics of singing. And, you know, the, I think the mantras, you know, really have a big part, you know, in it, the medicinal kind of healing power. But then they're just purely like the act of vocalizing in different ways, soothing, quieter voice, screaming, <laughs> cathartic, yeah. you know, release. Uh, I just think that that's, yeah, that's been a tool that has helped me to, I feel like, live with my darkness rather than stuff yeah. stuff it inside. You know? I know. I wonder about this, uh, the stuffing and what results from that even because you're ta- when you were talking about your morning practice i instantly thought about that like energy release and how amazing that is you know i think about like mr rogers i think talk talked about that like you know talking to the boys and girls and, and saying to them do you ever feel so angry that you just don't know what to do with it and he says what i do is i go to the piano and i just bang on the keys you know yeah. and it just gets that 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 energy out yeah. Um, so it's great to hear you talking about that and how that helps you to, and just to be aware of that, that we have like, like what's your insight and like even what's happening on an energetic level? Like how is the energy building up? And then how can we be aware that something needs to be released? I mean, is it just best to have a routine and a practice for releasing energy? Um, is there are just times when you're interacting in your regular life where you feel the need to do it and then you take a time out to release some energy? It's a blend of both for me. I think that the, the, practice, the daily practice, definitely, like the consistency of that yeah. is a go, go-to. And uh, I think it has a cumulative you know, impact. And um, you know, it reminds me, I, I, I listened to an interview with the poet Mary Oliver, mm-hmm. Um, and she said she, she wakes up a certain hour every morning and she goes to her desk and she writes mm-hmm. and that, uh, that's the appointment that she has with her muses. Yeah. And if she misses the appointment, 
her belief was like the muses won't trust her anymore, you know, mm. like, to meet to meet her. And so that's her commitment, like to connect to those inner spirits of creativity. And so I feel like that daily, you know, practice. And the thing is that I think sometimes we can sabotage our daily practice by being too ambitious, you know, or mm. having it be too big or too long or, you know, and so I think it sometimes, you know, independent, especially as a parent, sometimes it's just five minutes, you know, most of the time it's about 20 to 30 minutes or so singing first thing, but sometimes it has to just be shorter and that's okay, you know, and similarly with the other practices. Uh, so that, that definitely has, you know, a big impact. And then for sure, like uh, treating things more as they arise, uh, and, you know, by, you know, all right, I got to sing now like Mr. Rogers at the piano, you know, I love that. And, uh, you know, the band, um, the origin of the band, like we, our birthday is uh, August 29th, 2005, which was the day Hurricane Katrina, you know, hit New Orleans. And the the beginnings of the band was traveling around the country doing benefit concerts at a time when we were feeling incredibly angry, grief stricken, horrified, you know, by what was happening, you know, in our, in our city. And, um, and what was interesting was, and again, I, my perception is different from people that were living outside of New Orleans, but my perception was that event impacted a lot of people around the country who saw the video, you know, what was going on in the flooded streets and bodies and and they were genuinely like moved and wanted to help, you know? And so we, we weeped like with people, like while we sang, you know, who, people who cared like about what had happened, you know, in New Orleans. And we sang a lot of like Shiva mantras and Kali mantras. And those were, those were mantras that I knew, but I had never had the same kind of an experience like singing them as being, you know, under that, in that, in that situation. And um, that experience of the band like being born from this tragedy, this destruction like has been really influential like in the music that we've created, you know, over the last 18 years. We're not denying that it can be hard to be a human being, you know, and we can experience suffering as a part of, you know, of life. And also, so, so our music can be can have like darkness in it and tension, you know, and shadow. And also, of course, you know, release and tension and release and, and catharsis and openness and, and grace. Um, similarly, when my brother died, um, the thing that I felt like there was an energy that was pent up inside of me mm. and that, that was there until we started touring again, you know, mm. as a band. And uh, I started singing our songs again and, you know, it was with my, bandmates, you know, in this container, mm. uh, and it was a few months, you know, of grief before I went on the road again. And, um, and that was when I experienced my brother's spirit, you know, like the, I experienced energetically, like I felt his presence while I was singing, you know, with the band. And then also I felt like, again, just invisibly was processing, you know, a lot. it was almost like the, the, the music was like eating the Mm. the grief, you know, or something like that. And it's not like it's gone or disappeared, not, not at all. I still wince when I think about what happened to him. But I have a different relationship, you know, with him, with that experience and with the grief that I felt initially and that I feel like I would not have if I hadn't sung, mm. you know, many, many times mm. <laughs> to, to, to get there. Yeah. Mm. I sense like a, a, a great gratitude that you have for this practice, for this container of music. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I again, I'm not a proselytizer. You know, I don't. Everybody, I, you know, I think everybody can benefit from singing. I don't mm -hmm. think necessarily it's everybody's number one path. You know, but speaking for myself and folks that we've shared this practice with for many, many years now, like it's so healing. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's so powerful and. Uh, God, I mean, I just, I do find myself more in awe of it, like, you, you know, more than ever. And I think particularly after I'm in a state of even deeper gratitude for it in this phase of coming out of the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. in this period of time where 
we weren't able to gather, you know, and singing was like one of the most scary things to do, you know, in person together. And so we're in this phase right now where the world is opening up and people are gathering again indoors and singing together. And there is this um, really palpable gratitude, you know, yeah. that you feel from everyone. And, and it's like, may we never take that for granted again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hope, I really, that's my, my prayer. Like, because it's amazing, it's miraculous. Yeah. You know, I hope we don't get dull to it or get cynical about well, it. I feel that yeah. way in general, like about life. Yeah. Just like the abundance that many of us have, the majority of, of us have in so many ways. I mean, just to have access to food and shelter, right? Like it, it's hard, I find it hard not to take for granted. Yes. You know, like gratitude has been a um, very serious practice for me if, for some time. And what I notice about it is like, if I'm being honest with myself about being grateful, there are so many layers. And to really be grateful for what I have is like, whoa, that's, it's very ambitious. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I'll say, so it's like, and and so I noticed that. like, And and like you said, that that's part of the shadow and accepting the shadow is like, a part of what I am is just going to take things for granted and not have perspective all the time. And the more that I allow for that, I think then it opens up and then I, I can at least be more grateful. Yes, yeah. yeah. I always think about like, just part of the human experience is like forgetting. And yeah. remembering and forgetting and remembering, you know, and my experience, like spiritual practice, ideally is a way to remember, like more often, <laughs> a touchstone, you know, to come back to again and again, to remind ourselves, like, what's really important, what's really meaningful, you know, and, and it's so easy to forget, you know, it's so easy. It's crazy. Yeah. Maybe in today's world is more than ever before because there's so many distractions. Absolutely. So much noise. So much noise. <laughs> um, you know, thinking about like challenges as you're talking about like y your relationship with challenges and it's when I consider it, it's almost like a, a short circuiting happens in my mind because, you know, I don't want to experience like really hard challenges, the loss of loved ones, like all the, all these things, the pandemic happening. At the same time, the, the lesson is that amidst these hard experiences is something that is very valuable, right? So what is my relationship like with them in the future? Like, how do I view, I know challenges are going to happen in the future. How do I view them? Because there's an automatic resistance. And then there's this other part of me that knows that like there's value here, like don't be afraid of them. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel you. Um... You know, I feel like sometimes when I'm in the middle of something that's really difficult, it's so hard, like to trust that there's some fruit <laughs> yeah. or some seeds are being planted. And um, I don't feel like I'm very patient, you know, when, 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 when I, and, 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 and the feel the weight, you know, of it. But there still is like a part of me that Maybe sometimes it's a faint voice, you know, that's sort of like optimistic. <laughs> you know, that's just like, all right, well, one, you know, at some point, like you might, maybe you'll see like what um, gift, you know, there is in this experience is like horrible, you know, as it is. And it's not, it's different from bypassing it because uh, that's a different path where you just mm -hmm. like try to forget, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, sort of like toxic positivity, you know, it's yeah. not really that, but uh, it remind, reminds me a little bit, there's a passage from uh, Rilke's uh, Letters to a Young Poet. I don't know if you've ever mm -hmm. read that book, but it's a it's Rilke uh, writing letters back to a young poet who's asking him for advice on different things. And um, I can't, I'm gonna paraphrase, but he says, uh, he says, you know, my friend, uh, uh, if you, in your sadness, like if you can pay attention if you can be present enough in your sadness, you will perhaps be able to witness the seeds, you know, that are planted like in that dark shadow, you know, shadowy time. And then when something 
new eventually arises in your life, you will see the relationship, mm. like the through line between the depths of your sadness, you know, and the birth of this new mm -hmm. thing. It reminds me of you know, the no mud, no lotus, you know, yeah. the Buddhist, you know, uh, proverb. And uh, so I, I don't know, like I walk, I walk through, like my, my friend, uh, I have a friend named uh, Michelle Cassandra Johnson. You should interview her sometime. Uh, she's an amazing yoga teacher and, and uh, activist. She says, um, every day I walk through life with an, with a broken heart and an open heart. Mm. <laughs> and I like, I love that, like to hold space for both, you know, and I aspire to that because sometimes I do feel so brokenhearted that I don't feel open-hearted, you know? And sometimes I feel so, like I'll go to another side where I'm, you know, more distracting myself and forgetting about the suffering and maybe that's not so good, you know, in an, in an extreme. But to be able to hold yeah. both of those simultaneously feels like a, you know, a beautiful way to, to live. Yeah, and just to hold the experience of being a human being. Right. Yeah. When you're you're saying that, I was I was thinking about like when I'm going through experiences like that. If I'm really paying attention, what happens for me that I notice is how quickly I can, I'm fluctuating between the different states. Like literally, like less than a moment, I'm angry and then I'm accepting accepting of it, and then I see the fruit of it, and then I'm angry again. It's like so quick, and I wonder sometimes if like because of the limitations of language that we kind of pretend like things are more stable and solid <laughs> than they they really are from my experience when I'm paying attention there's the movement is very 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 fast i feel you yeah absolutely that's that's my experience as well and i think that even the kind of systems that have been created to help us to define and navigate those times like the stages of grief for example yeah. you know or, or the hierarchy of needs or you know yeah. like i feel like those are limited because it's sort of still saying well no you're in this stage now and yeah. then, then you'll go to this stage and it's like no what you were just describing is <laughs> within the period of a minute you might be visiting like four or five of them you know uh like where you were more um we're, we're, we're less linear yeah. You know, then, then perhaps, like you said, language it defines us as. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> For someone who maybe doesn't have much experience with kirtan, could you explain a little bit of, you know, what it is? How would you describe it to someone? And, and also maybe a reasonable first step of moving in the direction of having a, a practice? Sure. That's a great question. Well, I guess the first thing, where I always like to start is that singing, you know, is a part of almost every spiritual tradition, you know, on the planet. Mm. Uh, that to sing or to vocalize in some way is a part of rites of passage and rituals and ceremonies. You know, it, it, to, me, to me, it's a universal human experience that people have in many languages, you know, in many cultures. And... Uh, you can experience it in a in a church or a synagogue or a, a ceremony or tr indigenous you know ceremony or a, a, a Muslim mosque or a, or a, 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 a Jewish temple uh, and so and then beyond that you know we sing like think about like sporting matches there's this chanting thing <laughs> political rallies you know we raise our voices to create this united you know sense of we're 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 bigger. When we when we chant something together, you know, than we are individually, so there's something universal. So that's that's important for people to realize. Okay, so singing, like as a form of spiritual practice, is for everybody, mm -hmm. you know. And so kirtan would be the practice from the Hindu, you know, and the yoga well, the yoga traditions that is has a certain sort of form to it. One of the uh, main forums is also you can find in many different cultures around the world, which is call and response. Mm. So you'd sing a mantra and then 
the crowd would echo it back and then the leader sings the mantra, maybe a different melody and the crowd echoes it back in this way of like calling back and forth, create, creating this communal participatory, you know, interactive, energetic experience for everybody who's there. Uh, that's one form of uh, a vocal yoga practice that you can do communally. And then um, japa, which would be the practice of by yourself, like, chanting like one mantra over and over and over in a repetition. You could do it with mala beads or, you know, there's different methods and different tools would be another way to develop a personal relationship, you know, with a, with a mantra. And the mantra is something that is really, um, it's a sound that in the translation of mantra, it's like a, a sound that can help to like train the mind or free the mind or release ourselves from the restlessness and the impatience and the wildness you know of our of our mind it's a it's a, a sound that can really sort of soak up you know all the other wild sounds of our of our thoughts and allow for us to experience this deep sense of presence and each one has a different kind of energetic quality to it many of them have um, myths and stories that are attached to them that uh I feel like can take us to a universal, again, human place. So, and this is really important to me to really create context, you know, around mm -hmm. mantra practice, kirtan practice is, you know, I could say if I wanted to be really esoteric, you know, <laughs> I could say, um, you know, this next mantra is to Shiva, the, uh, the Lord of Destruction, <laughs> and he's the ashen-covered one uh, uh, with the uh, crescent moon and his dreadlocks and the Ganga flowing down, you know, uh, from his head, and and uh, he carries a trident, and you know, and, and someone who's never experienced that before would sit there and they're just like, "What the hell <laughs> are you asking me to chant to?" You know, and it's like all that is true, uh, but it's not necessary, you know, initially perhaps like to introduce, you know, um, I think that for me, in order to build a bridge, like mm -hmm. to people that haven't experienced uh, mantra before is to, to go to the thing that I think is most essential, which is the ar the archetypal mm -hmm. and a universal energy inside of these sounds. So for me, like Shiva is the, in, the inspiration of transformation, you know, and change and uh, really what we talked about earlier. So, so I might say, um, we're going to sing this mantra, Om Namah Shivaya. And it's a mantra for helping us to um, trust the grace inside transformation, you know, in change, and sometimes even destruction, even when that's difficult. A mantra that can help us to open to the gifts, you know, that, that might be, we, we might experience, you know, inside uh, change. And so if there's something that is in flux in your life right now, you know, if there's something that maybe you have some resistance to, or if you're being invited or even, you know, thrown into a situation where you might find, you know, you're being asked to change in some way, I invite you to sing this mantra, you know, with me to really open to the possibilities, you know, inside that change. And to me, like that introduction, that mm -hmm. context, you know, f around the sort of universal archetypal meanings and qualities uh, that really meets people where they are because it's going to the human experience. And uh, and it's like, if I heard someone say that, I'd be like, all right, yeah, I'll chant this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, am, I am experiencing that. I can yeah. identify with that. I don't know if I can identify with the trident. Right. And the, you know, so, um, so that is important to me, like as a teacher, to build bridges, to make, you know, these practices relevant and I'm not making anything up you know I'm not pretending like it's something different I'm just more going to the underground river mm. that I was talking about earlier mm. you know that the the uh, the essence you know I mean I love the, the the lotus temple here and the and all the altars you know and honoring all these different paths you know to to the one and uh there's something like essential that's I feel like is being celebrated you know inside the temple and that's what I'm seeking to do when I speak to these universal human experiences and mm -hmm. qualities you know uh, another thing that I like to speak to which I think is a really great uh, way to communicate and contextualize sonic practices is you know there's great um, 
scientific and medical, you know, mm-hmm. benefits. So the chanting actually uh, activates a mechanism in the inner ear that feeds the brain electrical potential. It tones the vagus nerve uh, and has this incredible impact on our nervous system. You know, it releases all these endorphins. I think it's something like chanting or singing for 20 minutes, like releases more endorphins than like running for an hour. You know? <laughs> uh, people heal more quickly uh, from cancer, recovering from cancer. There's one group that chants, you know, and another group doesn't. The group that chants, you know, their healing is more accelerated. Um, the world is made of sound, you know, like this table right here, it looks really solid, but it's actually on a subatomic level. Mm. It's vibrating molecules that are humming and dancing. And I feel like when we sing, we really get more into that true perception, you know, of we're just, we are vibration. <laughs> There's a lot more I could share, but I yeah. feel like I've gone on. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, a few things here. One is that I, I wonder, is even, you know, when we speak about benefits, uh, whether it's the benefit of, of mantra or even teaching yoga, you know, the benefits of the asana, whatever, whatever it is, I wonder, are there maybe many humans that are even struggling with the intention of taking care of themselves, right? It's like for, for some people, it might be like an obvious thing, like, oh, you tell me the benefit of this, if, and then that's my goal to, you know, make this, this being that I am have more intimate relationship with the best possible being that it can be, you know, in order to not only benefit myself, or I believe that that will benefit everyone. And some are clear on that. But I think some people are maybe really confused about this, that the, the intention is not even clear to take care of, of the self. And because of, like, that leads to a lot of confusion and want, wondering about what to do with myself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree with you. And there's lots of reasons. I mean, some people just don't have the support, you know, or the or the food, you know, how do you take care of yourself? You can't feed yourself, you know, or you have the, the, the income to be able to do that. And then I think other people, different circumstances where, you know, there, there's a message that oh, I should be selfless, you yeah. know, and help all the time other people. And one thing, and we talked about forgetting and remembering earlier, one of the things that I forget <laughs> oftentimes is that when I nourish myself, like through self-care, that that actually gives me more energy to be of service to my loved ones and my community. And I'm curious too, if you have this experience, like I don't see why it isn't possible to also feel that way of when I'm um, being in service to someone else. Like that also feeds me in a way. Like, oh, is yeah. there anything that I can't view as self care? Oh, I love that. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, because I and I think that I think it probably also ties into this idea of dharma, you know, and people feeling like a sense of purpose, you know, in their life. And um, I think for many, their sense of purpose is to serve. You know, and, and so that it, 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 there's this feed, feedback, you know, and this nourishment, you know, that comes from that. But I think that there are a lot of people that are confused, you know, about their purpose, you know, and, dhar- and their dharma. And um, it might even feel like selfish or something like that to even yeah. put energy into trying to figure out, you know, what that what that is. Uh, so um, I think it's important to. just start small (laughs) don't you think like little bits and little morsels you know to especially for folks that have a lot of resistance to to self-care you know just and another thing that i realize again and again is sometimes just a little bit of as as a parent you know as well just like god five minutes in a quiet (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Five minutes of quiet gives me the energy that I think going on a retreat on the other side of the world, <laughs> you know, it just like a little bit can go a long way. It's like homeopathic, you know? Yeah. One of my favorite things about Kirtan is the silence when the chants are yeah, done, yeah. which is so unique. So you don't, 
You yeah. don't get that when you go to most concerts. It's just, you know, the song ends and then wild cheers and then the next song totally. begins. But it's in that silence. And I think, you know, we all feel it when you're experiencing it. It's like, wah. Absolutely. So I'm constantly wondering about and just paying attention to my relationship with the silence. And I'm, I'm witnessing it being nurtured and how can we balance it? And the kirtan just has a beautiful balance, I think. It does. And, and for people that have challenges with silence, you know, that are really uncomfortable or find it really awkward, I find chanting to be this beautiful gateway, you yeah. know, into the, the contrast between the full volume, you know, of voices and that vibration and resonance. And then, like you said, just like sitting and like steeping, like bathing in silence. And it's not really silence because there's the sound of our thoughts and our feelings and sensations, but there's more room to perceive, mm -hmm. you know, that blanket. And for the, a lot of folks that, you know, like you said, in our culture, holding silence is a rare thing. It's uncomfortable and awkward. And a lot of times, like, I'll just encourage people to say, you know, is it, you see if there's some treasure like underneath the awkwardness, you know, be patient. If there's any like gifts underneath the uncomfortableness and the self-consciousness, just be patient enough to see what bubbles up there, you know? So yeah, man, I, I feel love you that. on that. Sean, thank you so much for thank taking you, the time. Thank you, Avi, it was joy. This. If uh, someone listening is interested in hearing some of your music or getting in touch with uh, you and your work, what's the best way? Yes, our website is Sean Johnson and the Wild Lotus Band dot com. Mm -hmm. uh, Spotify, Apple Music are great um, platforms to listen to our music. We have a YouTube channel with some videos. Uh, I uh, have been in the process of creating a collective of mm -hmm. uh, spiritual and chant based musicians called the Oracle Collective. It's A U R I C L E. And we have over 160 musicians from around the world uh, mm -hmm. making this music and really seeking to be like a hub where people mm -hmm. can discover more chant and spiritual music and support, you know, these artists. Uh, so I um, encourage you to check uh, Oracle, uh, oraclecollective.com would be the website there. You can follow us on social media, Instagram and Facebook. And uh, we tour year round and hopefully we'll come somewhere near where your listeners are so we can come and, and sing together. <laughs> awesome. We'll put this all in the, uh, in the notes as well. <laughs> Wishing you that. a wonderful weekend. Thanks Thank so much you, again, brother. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this content and think others might as well, please feel free to share and subscribe.